So welcome today again, we'll talk with Buddhist monk and scholar Bhikkhu Inalio. And in this episode, he introduces the idea of opening the heart as the fundamental purpose of all our practice and how to relate our mindfulness meditation practice on the cushion to a compassionate response to the world. So what can early Buddhism and Bhikkhu Inalio's research contribute to responding to the suffering of the world today? That's what I wanted to explore with him. I was thinking when you were speaking earlier about the differences in your experience, presumably also of teaching in Asia and in the West. I mean, the West is a broad idea, but but um, just how strong individualism is in the contexts um, in the in the Western contexts and the sort of intellectualism, a well, certain kind of intellectualism and a certain kind of uh, um, individualism. I was really struck, particularly in in the introducing mindfulness. How how quickly and strongly um, you you introduce mindfulness of other external mindfulness yeah. sensitivity to impact um, ethics uh, awareness of kind of much broader social and and climate issues in that um, is do you think it's an, and, and a lot of the mindfulness practices and the forms anyway that are being taught at the moment don't necessarily incorporate, say, yeah. sangha relational dimensions. How important is that? And what do you think we should be doing in relation to that? I actually think it's crucial and I'm happy you're, you're bringing this up. You see, the again, not mindfulness as such, but the establishments of mindfulness, there is this internal and external. Mm. And in the experience I had living as a monk in Sri Lanka, the external and the internal, they were naturally woven together. Mm. I had this uh, meditation center on the outskirts of Kandy, and of course we were there to meditate, but we were also doing all kinds of social work. I mean, how, how could you do otherwise? Outside the door, people are hungry, people have problems, I can't look away. Mm. And this is just natural. It's just this part. And, and my teacher, Gopin Samaratne, he was doing all these different projects. And mm. But at the same time, he was a meditation teacher. And we never saw a conflict in that. Mm. It was just a question of sometimes finding, oh, I'm doing too much on the external. And sometimes I'm too much on the internal. But just coming back to balance. And when I came to the West, and I found this, it's kind of almost like two different camps, you know. Mm. Or you're a meditator. Well, then you don't really care what happens in the world. Oh, you care about the world, then you are full there, climate change, racism, whatever it is. But you're so busy, you don't have time to meditate. I'm exaggerating a little bit, just to, to make my point. Maybe only a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's recognizable, that characterization. Yeah. And, and I feel that uh, we should all, we, sh we should bring these two sides together because there are two dimensions of mindfulness. And if I if I get completely lost in in say climate change, then I'm then I'm actually running this tunnel vision, and I become the savior of the world or not. And it's very frustrating, and it's not really nourishing my practice, and my practice is not nourishing my activism. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, if I just switch off, and I'm a vipassana practitioner, I'm just the walking the path to awakening, and I hope the world doesn't collapse on till the time I've reached that goal and the rest doesn't. I mean, what is that? The meditation is about opening the heart, no? Mm. That's the key. Mm. Mm. In fact, this is what I often tell to yogis when they come to certain experience. I think, very nice, but what does it do to you? Did it open your heart? Mm. That's, that's the keystone, the marker for progress in meditation. Has the heart opened? Mm. Not, oh, I had this so-and-so in some nice technical terms. Good, good, but what does it do to you? Mm. And then what is, do, does it do to me, do to you? That is, I see that not on the cushion, but also how I deal with people. Yeah. And I think this is really integral also of early Buddhism, uh, what, we've, what we find there, because it really gives us this impression that the Buddha did not want us to be just completely withdrawn from society and only meditate as monastics. I mean, the Buddha in quotation marks, the Buddha in the suttas, not, I don't have any certainty about the historical person. But. And there's this, this beautiful story about one monk and he wanted to have more time to practice and not have to go out every day to beg. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he 
collected the food, rice, and he dried the rice. Mm. And then he ate that for seven days or so, and just moistening the dry rice. And, you know, one time in, back in Thailand, where I ordained before ordaining in Sri Lanka, I had some illness and I had to eat just plain rice for a week. It's disgusting, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm really not like a gourmet and concerned about taste too much, but just eating plain rice is just horrible. And then if you dry it and then moisten it. So I would have thought this monk is like, wow, wow, he's really powerful practice. The Buddha said, no way, nothing mm -hmm. doing. Every day out on the road. Yeah. Yeah. And I take this, I mean, as a, as a, as a strong pointer that, uh, yes, seclusion is very important. Dedication to practice, silent retreat is very important, but it's not a means uh, in its own, for, for its own sake. It points to something else. Mm -hmm points to that inner transformation and that inner transformation benefits from contact with the outer world and it wants to express itself in the outer world. So it seems that your earlier work, all the bits that I've seen published earlier, you've been talking about um, uh, concentrating quite a lot on the foundations of, of, of mindfulness in various forms using different suttas and more and more your research and your, what you're speaking about is, is a mindfulness, if you like, applied to the context of, uh, well, you've just, you've just come out with this book called The Superiority Conceit earlier this year, which is punchy. And, um, well, you start off with uh, conceit uh, in relation to women practitioners, for example. Uh, and you've been writing about that for a long time. Um, and then more recently, you've uh, written a book on uh, climate change, in particular, and mindfulness and climate change. And as you said at the beginning, it's, a, it's something that you're quite concerned um, about uh, and you write about it regularly. I suppose um, this is partly a, a question that Devan would have asked you if he was here at the moment, um, which is that mindfulness obviously helps us and, and those people who are, are attempting to do something about the climate situation and the conditions that have led to the, the current situation. Um, uh, and mindfulness, as you say, helps in terms of balance between activism and, and meditation practice. But is, are there elements of the Buddhist worldview? Is there a way of understanding our relationship with the natural world and who we are as humans that can be informed by a Buddhist view uh, in addition to uh, mindfulness as a practice. Yeah, and I go in quite some detail into that in my book. I mean, the basic perspective of seeing the whole situation from the viewpoint of the root defilements, mm. anger, greed, and delusion. Mm. And, and that, that, is, that is a way of conceptualizing, uh, which I find very beneficial, and then seeing it as a call for contemplation of impermanence. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, we know that for modern science, this planet is anyway going to end in ashes and uh, would be, but it's meaningful to try to uh, make it possible for human beings to continue a little bit longer than our present perspectives are. So it's it's important to stand up, but at the same time also to see this broader perspective. I was wondering about the significance of, say, the elements practice in in relation to this awareness of our relationship with the natural world. Yeah, that uh, comes up usually when I teach uh, the establishment of mindfulness, the Satipatthana. This is one of the three body exercises that we find in all versions. And element practice really, many people, many yogis find that it really helps them to connect to nature because some of this, me here and the rest of the world over there, this dissolves. Mm -hmm. Because it's all just element, whether it's this body or that body or things outside. And this is something particular in our Western society and civilization. We have lost this natural connectedness with the nature mm. and uh, element practice can really help us to re-establish that. In fact, I have a friend who is also a mindfulness teacher and she is a Native American 
And she is now teaching my element meditation to Native Americans. And she says they love it because they have this natural connectedness and they also have the four elements. Mm. But by combining that with this body scan, the way I do, they have something very tangible to, to, to put it into practice. Mm. 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 Um, I suppose there's that one of the things I find interesting if you are reading what you've written and other people have written about the elements practice, I think there's a sort of materialist way of viewing the elements, isn't it? Like here is earth and, you know, saliva is water as a sort of uh, running through the body. But actually those elements are, are qualities, if you like, that are that are not, I think it can get, yeah, how do you, how do you, um, what is my question? Yeah, the element practice is not just about dealing with uh, sort of uh, the nature of material uh, material in the world and the material that makes up the body. It's also a practice about our view and the nature of the mind and perception. Going back to everything is imagined, perhaps, in that way. <laughs> yeah, the, the elements in a later tradition, because there was a general trend in ancient India, to develop like atomistic theories. And so in a later tradition, there's a lot of concern with the elements as atom, atoms, atom kind of quality. But in the early teachings, there are more qualities. Mm -hmm. And we get the four, but we also sometimes get six. So then there's space and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, early Buddhist thought does not endorse a body-mind dualism in any way. And the qualities can also be applied to the mind. There's an instruction to, by the Buddha to his son, Rahula, mm. develop uh, your mind like earth, like water, giving like certain uh, qualities of these elements as an inspiration for developing the corresponding mental attitude. Mm. Mm. But the main thing, the main pointer of the element, in the way I understand, is really towards emptiness. Mm. which with a more atomistic kind of approach can get a little bit uh, lost from sign. It's really that they're just qualities and you can, you can deconstruct them one into the other. Mm. Earth depends on cohesion, water, water depends on temperature, fire, fire depends on movement and wind depends on space. And then you're not, not left with any, any, any uh, atom or nucleus or whatever it is, but it's just, it's just qualities. Mm. And these qualities are inside and outside. They're just the same qualities. Mm. I suppose my question always is, in, in a way, is with these um, sort of a what would in, what would wisdom as applied to the individual in relation to say and skillful means apply in in terms of climate change, for example. Um, you know, there's obviously it would be very helpful if all of us became more sensitive to the impact of, of what we do and understood more clearly our interconnectedness, say, uh, with everything and each other. Um, but are the kinds of um, meditation practices, contemplative practices sufficient to engage with the institutionalizations, if you like, of greed or hatred or delusion that we see? Uh, regularly. They provide the source for facing this, but then each of us also has to embody the understandings gained on the cushion in the way we relate to the world. And this can be activism that can be can take all kinds of different forms. Mm. Mm. But in my mind, uh, the, the key point uh, that I think Buddhism can offer there is not just the elements, but it is precisely a correction to the general trend in modern society, particularly evident here in the USA, for this postmodern uh, deconstruction of truth, deconstruction of morality, and celebration of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. these, these three I consider uh, central culprits for our inability to deal with climate change, for having elected somebody like Donald Trump, who is really this is exactly what he is an icon for disregard for morality, completely bending of truth and the celebration of subjectivity. And this whole postmodern trend uh, threatens to destroy humanity. Mm. Mm. And so as Buddhists, we can say, no, there is truth. 
It's not some because the Buddha declared it some past, but we are talking about the construction of experience. Nirvana is the deconstruction of experience, and that is the truth reference. Mm -hmm. That is where early Buddhist epistemology takes its root for the conception of truth. And there is mundane truth. There's the truth of saying, like, uh, uh, you are so-and-so and you're not another person. I mean, that's just this basic correspondence. Mm -hmm. And then morality, of course, as a monk, I don't have to talk. Ethics is, is such an important foundation. And subjectivity needs to be recognized, but not to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Because if we celebrate subjectivity, we get into selfing and uh, I mean mine. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, potential in the Buddhist teachings to, to, to counterbalance these, these kind of trends, mm. which is why I find it particularly sad when some modern Western Buddhists want to chuck out precisely these things, like pretend the Buddha didn't teach truth. Yeah. This, is, this is not what we need right now. We need to recover the concept of truth. Mm. Understandable that religious truth claims have been debunked and then science has been debunked. But why do people not listen to scientists telling us about climate change? It's because they're suspicious of them. Yeah. Oh, let these guys talk. And they have to actually experience it to believe it's really happening. But that's already too late. Mm -hmm. And this happens because of this debunking of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is where I think we as Buddhist practitioners can simply stand up and say, there's, there's the, of course, not all postmodernism is wrong. There are good points there and there, but these particular developments lead us in the wrong direction. It's gone too far. Mm. Mm. Is this what you're working on more at the moment in terms of your writing and research or your responsiveness? This is exactly what I'm, yeah. what I'm heading right now. Yeah. So, uh, trying to, to, to write a corrective to postmodern tendencies which are self-destructive. Well, I think in view of climate change and the uh, vast scale destruction is going to happen and the tendency to what right wing and wars and everything, we people need to network. Mm. In Buddhists and with other traditions, we need to network because alone we can't handle that. Mm. So my brothers and sisters uh, in the Buddhist fold stop looking down on each other. Mm accept each other for being different, let each other do what they want, but let us network and, 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 and try to connect on, on, on those central values that we sometimes hope that will help humanity to survive. Mm. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get on with it then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you and uh, wish you all the best with your work. Yeah. Thank you for the lovely interview and I also wish you all the best. Thank you, Inalio. Go well. Bye-bye. Windhorse Publications is part of the Tri Ratna Buddhist community and this podcast is sponsored by Future Dharma Fund, a Buddhist fundraising charity which helps fund Dharma projects across the world, including ours. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider donating to them to help them fund current and future projects like ours. You can find out more about Wintour's publications by going to our website. <laughs>